mode. Everyone, I want to welcome everyone, both in the U.S. and internationally, to today's webcast, Flushable or Not, Dispersing the Non-Dispersible Problem. My name is Christine Racky, and I'm a Program Manager for the Water Environment Federation's Water Science and Engineering Center. I will be moderating today's webcast, and I'm also here with my colleague, Rebecca Arvin, who will help with any technical issues on our end. I'm also here with one of our speakers, Hiram, and all the other speakers are remote. This is organized by West Collection Systems Committee and is sponsored by JWC Environmental and Xylem. Before we begin, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. PDF of all the PowerPoint presentations for today's webinar are available for downloading at West FTP link, which is listed in this slide. This link was distributed via email yesterday and will be distributed again tomorrow for anyone that registered after the time of distribution. The FTP link also contains information on how to receive professional development hours for those eligible to receive these training credits. There are two PDH credits available for this webcast. You will need to complete the evaluation form to receive the PDH certificate. Your feedback on this webcast is important and helps identify future webcast topics that are timely and helpful to viewers like you. Please follow the PDH instructions and check with your state accreditation agency on how to receive this credit. The other item available within the FTP link is a guide to use GoToWebinar, which will help you with any technical, technical issues you may have on your end. Okay, so during this webcast, while you cannot speak directly to the presenters, you will have an opportunity to submit questions by typing in your specific question via the question pane that appears on your PC, as illustrated in this slide. Um, I will be accumulating questions, and I will direct them to presenters at the end of the webcast. So please be sure to specify if a question is for one specific speaker, or if it's for all speakers, or a combination of speakers. Please note that we will be recording this webcast, and a link will be sent to all registered users tomorrow so that you can share it with colleagues who could not attend today. Further, if you have any questions after the webcast has ended, please email webcast at wef.org. All right, so I just want to quickly go down the agenda. Um, I will read a brief bio for each presenter right before the person speaks. Um, first, we're going to have Frank Dick speak on, um, well, he's going to give an over overview of why flushable wipes are a problem to the water industry. He will discuss efforts to challenge product claims of flushability of convenience wipes by various testing methods. He will also discuss the importance and methods to quantify costs for ma managing clogs, blockages, and other issues associated with non-dispersible materials. Nick Arjantes will follow sharing public education efforts that Orange County Sanitation District has been doing for the last few years. He will also share highlights of a recent panel discuss discussion, which was held at the California WEA conference between representatives of the wastewater utilities and non-woven industries. Abby Strauss will then follow with um, a discussion on legislative efforts and lessons learned that Maine has done to set flushability standards, and will compare it with California, Washington, and New Jersey efforts. Finally, we have Hiram Tanner, who will put it, pull everything together and share what's happening on a national level. While you're typing in questions for the QA portion, we will hear our, from our sponsors, Xylem and JWC Environmental. I'd like to thank them again, because without them, we would not be able to host this webcast at no cost. One more thing before I introduce our first speaker. I do want to acknowledge that a lot of the work that has been happening around Flushables is because of the partnership and open collaboration we have with the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, which is NACWA, the American Public Works Association, APWA, and all the other acronyms listed on this slide. Hiram will go into more detail of activities already in place nationally during his portion of the webinar. You will hear a lot of these acronyms throughout the webcast, so we've listed it all here for your reference. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Frank Dick is a wastewater engineer and industrial pretreatment coordinator for the city of Vancouver in the state of Washington. He manages the city's delegate pretreatment program, which includes 18 significant industrials. He also is charged with capital improvement projects and energy efficiency efforts for the city's wastewater treatment facilities. 
Prior to his six years in wastewater engineering, Frank spent 20 years in environmental and facilities engineering at semiconductor facilities in the Portland, Vancouver area. Frank has a BS in chemical engineering from Washington State University and is a licensed PE in the states of Washington and Oregon. With that, I now introduce Frank. Well, I'm handing over the controls to Frank. So Frank, take it away. All right. Hopefully everybody can hear me and see my presentation. So just a quick overview um, again. Throughout this and other presentations, you'll see that we're all experiencing problems with clogged pipes and pumps as more and more convenience materials come onto the market for consumers. So I'll talk about materials that are causing these problems and then talk about some efforts that Vancouver and others across the country have done to challenge uh, particularly packaging claims, particularly packages of uh, materials that are labeled as flushable. Um, Frank, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're having a hard time hearing you. Okay. Um, you maybe pick up your handset. Would that work? Yeah. Yeah. Just a sec. Is that better? Yes, much better. Okay, let's do that. Okay, thanks, Frank. Yeah. Um, and then lastly, um, it's important for wastewater, the wastewater industry and its trade associations to calculate costs associated with maintenance, labor, electricity, and equipment replacement so that our local state and federal government leaders understand financial impacts to our sewer collection and treatment systems. So pipe and pump clogs have become so prevalent and common that the issue is now forefront for many utilities across the country, and it's starting to get uh, public attention. So as I mentioned earlier, clogged pumps, clogged pumps and pipes have real and significant costs, including maintenance, disposal, and equipment costs, and electrical costs. And furthermore, it's not listed on this slide, but these conditions prevent, in my mind, worker, significant worker safety and ergonomic issues and increase, increases risk for sewer backups and overflows. So the, pro the clogging problem is increasing as more and more convenience products are available for consumers. With those products come increasing confusion and perceptions of flushable versus non-dispersable versus uh, packaging labels such as disposable and so on. So, so what I like to call, what are the culprits um, that we're seeing? Um, what do we consider uh, the culprits of the clogging issues? There are more and more products being marketed as flushable, including diapers, personal wipes, cleaning wipes, and other cleaning materials. There's also just as many, if not more, products that are marked as disposable on packaging and include a do not flush label. However, such disposal labels are often small and placed on the back sides of product packaging. And uh, as these pictures show here, uh, there's a couple of examples of labels that are placed under these packaging flaps, so they, they become really difficult to um, define. And furthermore, it's not just wipes and diapers. It's other materials that, that can easily be flushed down a toilet, feminine hygiene products, dental floss, condoms, clothing and bed sheets, cotton materials, paper towels, plastic bags, food wrappers, and many more materials um, we're all seeing in our collection systems. So wipe, the, the wipes that I've been talking about and other convenience products are made of what's called non-woven uh, materials, which are natural and synthetic fibers that are bonded by engineered uh, materials and processes to provide certain strength and durability properties. So the graphic here um, is, uh, is, is provided by INDA, which is the industry that represents uh, non-woven, shows a market trend um, of non-woven starting from 2001. So when you look at 2001 versus 2011, um, we've seen an increase of materials come to market three times. And then uh, according to this graphic, um, from 2001 to 2016, the market should grow five times. And I can tell you in our experience in Vancouver, we're seeing that kind of uh, growth and uh, problems in our systems uh, accordingly. 
So I want to move on to challenging claims on that you see on packaging of these materials. And I'll go through four uh, types of studies that many of us have done uh, across the country. This first slide, uh, field study number one, shows a simple bench top test using um, a beaker filled with water, a magnetic stir, and, uh, and, and putting uh, wipes into these things and observe uh, what happens to them. So in this study here, um, it's recorded that after five minutes, the left-hand side toilet paper uh, breaks down uh, rapidly, um, and then the other, uh, uh, the, the right-hand side picture shows a flushable wipe that's been put into the speaker. After 24 hours, you can still see it's in a pretty whole form. Uh, in Vancouver, uh, the first test was done in, in Orange County, um, California. Uh, we repeated the test in Vancouver. We saw our toilet paper disperse after 40 seconds. And uh, in this picture, after 16 hours, the flushable wipe that we put into that beaker uh, still holds. Holds. So anybody can do this in their, in their lab, and I encourage them to do so. Uh, field study number two was uh, what we call a forensic um, uh, study uh, conducted in the state of Maine with the state of Maine's uh, Wastewater Control Association, along with uh, representatives of the WEF uh, Collection System Committee, INDA, and, um, and actually a couple of uh, industry representatives. So they were the first really to evaluate um, the makeup of materials and clogs and conducted a coordinated test with uh, product with these uh, representatives. Um, they actually used a uh, standard operating procedure that they had written up to, to conduct this test. Um, this is just one, one of their studies uh, that they've done. Uh, this is the results that came out of that, 42% were paper products, uh, things like paper towels out of public restrooms, 24% uh, baby wipes, 17% feminine hygiene products, 8% that they identified as flushable wipes, and 10% uh, in another category. So uh, during this study, the folks that were involved were able to kind of make, draw some conclusions from that. 90% um, of the products removed from the sewer uh, during the test are non-flushable. Uh, the flushable products um, do not have a lot of structural strength in terrorism, but they tend to be uh, collected in full form. Uh, paper towels are, are an issue, and uh, baby wipes are really indestructible pieces of, of plastic and just uh, won't break down. So for the third test, uh, this, this was a test uh, developed in Parson, New Jersey, uh, by a gentleman with the WEF Collection System Committee. Um, they developed a, a, a portable toilet where they can uh, demonstrate by multiple flushes whether or not certain materials will disperse, break down, or not. So they've, they've been using this a bit. Um, this is an example where they took a package of flushable wipes and with the same uh, wipe materials flushed it uh, 100 times and still found the material uh, intact. Uh, here's a nice engineering drawing <laughs> to, uh, that, that shows the, the makeup of, of these toilets. And if anybody is really serious about wanting to, um, to, to replicate this, we can certainly um, provide more detailed information for that. And just as an example, in Bothell, Washington, as far as I know, this is the second uh, system that's been uh, been made uh, a replication of the Parsapati system. And it's been in place for about a month now and uh, taken around to public events and so on. It's a really good way to, to demonstrate issues with flushability. And then uh, here in Vancouver, Washington, we did uh, a field study. We wanted to go straight to the sewer and see see what happens when we put uh, wipes into our collection system. So we uh, identified three drop sites, three manholes that we were going to drop um, flushable wipes and baby wipes, and then and then go to the treatment plant and and pick them off of the screening. So uh, 
The reference to MP is a marine, marine park plant. Vancouver has two plants. The other one's called uh, West Side. So you can see the various distances there. The furthest one, uh, almost a mile away. And I'll show some pictures uh, from results from that. So um, this is the first test that we did, the, the dumping from about 500 of, or 800 feet away. Uh, five minutes travel time through the sewer. Uh, we picked these up off a uh, screening system, but this was, uh, we have a, one of our plants has a screening system after our influent pumps. So the red, dark red um, wipes that you see there were actually the flushable wipes and actually did tear up a little bit through the pumps. The less red or kind of the orangish color ones are baby wipes and they are indestructible. They they stayed fully intact. And then the other white ones um, were just other uh, wipes that we picked off the screenings. So that was done at our at Vancouver's Marine Park plant. The other two studies were done at the West Side treatment plant, and we have a screening device um, ahead of our influent pump. So these materials come straight to the plant and, pat, um, and the wastewater flows through the screens. So in this picture, um, this shows what we did from dropping uh, wipes in a manhole about uh, 1,000 feet away uh, through an interceptor line that flows about 4 million gallons a day, 14 minutes um, travel time in the sewer. The red uh, wipes there, show, shown in that little quilt pattern, um, are wipes that were labeled as flushable. The orange ones are baby wipes. And in this test, we saw no distinction. The, the so-called flushable wipes were fully intact as we picked them off the, um, the influence screens. And then finally, um, this was another uh, test we did. The, the furthest one away, um, about 5,000 feet away, almost a mile, 45 minutes in the sewer, uh, basically the same results. The red ones are the flushable ones. Um, the other ones are blue. They're not orange. Um, we, we just used a different dye color for this particular test. So I want to talk um, a little bit about our experience in calculating um, our cost to to show our leaders, you know, the the, the financial impact of the problem. So uh, we've we've recorded uh, about seventy eight thousand dollars annually in maintenance. That's to deploy workers to go out in the field and derag uh, pumps. Um, these pumps operate when they're clogged up, not efficiently on their pump curve. So um, we we understand about $30,000 $30, annually in added electricity costs to, to run clogged pumps. And over the past uh, five years, Vancouver has um, aggressively replaced uh, pumps with non-clogged pumps at a cost of close to $1 million uh, for capital improvement dollars. And then finally, um, we collect about 429 tons of rags and other debris from our screenings um, from, from our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the, the previous slide I showed was uh, for, our, for Vancouver's larger pump stations. Vancouver has about 36 smaller pump stations in its service area of about 200,000 people. And, uh, we, and in the smaller pump stations, we've retrofitted eight stations at a cost of $160,000 and deferred $50,000 in maintenance costs. So these are significant and real um, dollars we're talking about. Uh, the larger uh, pump sta stations from a couple of slides ago, in all cases, we've had to replace pumps before the end of their, their useful life. And the pumps, these were pumps that were installed at newer pump stations in, in the 1990s. Um, lastly, I just wanted to go over a, a form that was um, developed by the uh, Southern California um, uh, Alliance for POTWs. And this is an incident report form that we're encouraging folks to fill out as they experience uh, clogs in pipes and pumps. It's a form uh, to help guide folks to uh, record the incident, to record cost of deploying folks to, 
to go out in the, the field, um, actions taken, uh, whether decisions are going to be made to make changes to the pump station, uh, replace pumps, and, and so on. Um, and then again, uh, estimating uh, a cost associated with this. And fairly new form that was developed in the last few months, but we're really trying to push it out for folks to fill out and to uh, bring it to one uh, kind of clearinghouse. And that will be um, uh, presented uh, later, maybe not in this webinar, but uh, we're, we're definitely trying to get the information out to folks. So what can, um, what can you do um, across, across the country, uh, sewer agencies and so on? Um, document, document really helps, helps, um, helps us. Preventative and corrective maintenance tasks in sewers and pump stations and treatment plants. Recording labor hours and costs associated with deragging and other issues with uh, um, unclogging pipes and pumps. Um, documenting equipment repair and replacement costs, fuel costs associated with um, deployment of folks to the field, um, debris hauling fees, and uh, of course blockages and SSO, uh, sewer sanitary overflow events and fines associated with that. And we want people to, um, to share information uh, with us and with others. And Right now, I think the best way to do that is to, to look at the incident report form that will be available to you and to, um, and to, to start using it as a, as a guide to, to, to record your cost. And with that, this is my last slide. Christine? OK, thank you, Frank. Um, we do have one question for you. Uh, when you did the test, were different brands of wipes used? Yes. Um, particularly for the flushable, we challenged one particular brand, but for the um, baby wipes, we use uh, several different brands. Um, and we, we've just started this testing a couple of months ago, and we intend to, um, to test other uh, products, both marketed as flushable and, and non-flushable. OK. Now, are you going to also do um, your own parsa potty? Um, we are <laughs> going to do it. <laughs> Maybe one day we can have a competition of the best parsa potty. <laughs> yeah. So, Hi. and that's, that kind of brings a good point because we went when we went out to the field, we we dumped these dyed wipes in manholes. But um, maybe to kind of complete the test, we'd like to take the parsa potty with us and actually do a flush into the manhole. <laughs> but that's my thinking. OK, well, great. Thank you, Frank. Um, of course, we'll, we'll get to some more questions um, afterwards. I'm just going to go on to Nick. Um, and uh, let's, again, thank, thank you, Frank. So let me uh, give a brief bio on, on Nick Arhantes, our next speaker. He's the Director of Facility Support Services for Orange County Sanitation District in California. Nick's team manages the successful operation and maintenance of numerous infrastructure systems, including the wastewater collection facilities and various services and support facilities owned and managed by OCSD. Nick has over 30 years' experience with engineered systems locally, regionally, and internationally in both the private and public sectors with assets ranging from structures to high-speed turbo machinery. He was an innovator and stimulator in moving OCSD to advance asset management strategies, as well as working teams to improve the delivery of capital improvement projects and CIP management processes. I'd also like to point out that Nick is also instrumental in getting NACWA, APWA, and WEF members and staff together to discuss how to deal with flushable yet non-dispersible products. Nick holds a BS degree in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, he is a registered PE in California and holds grade four collection systems and grade four mechanical technologist certifications from CWEA. And with that, I would love to, I am honored <laughs> to um, introduce Nick, who is also a WEF 2005 Collection Systems Awardee. So Nick, take it away. Thank you very much, Christine. And I'm happy to help today. Again, my presentation is going to be in two segments. 
First, I want to cover our what to flush effort that we developed at OCSD. And then second, a little bit of information about the panel discussion that I participated on uh, in Palm Springs recently with members of INDA, uh, myself, and uh, Bob from Xylem, and also representative from JWC. First, our What to Flush campaign. Our agency serves the southwest uh, part of uh, the California, and we're a coastal uh, discharger. We have 24 different utilities upstream of us that discharge from their local sewers into our regional sewers. And we also own one of these local sewer utilities. So we have a small pipe system with its problems. And then we also have a medium and large diameter pipe system and large pumping plants with different problems. We have a strategic plan and our mission statement and vision statement. And this is our vi a mission statement out of our strategic plan. And again, all wastewater utilities are here to protect public health. That's our core business. With our utility, we are also concerned about reclaiming our water, because part of it is used for aquifer recharge in the central Orange County area uh, that's provided by a sister agency. The goals of our outreach program, when we started to really rethink and redesign this, was we wanted to have the public involved in the process of making decisions about reliability and life of our infrastructure. This is all tied to fees. And we wanted them to be cognizant of the problems that are caused in blocking sewers and sewer spills that can close surface waters. And again, the, the concern on water reclamation. Anything you introduce into the wastewater stream has potential to carry over into the reclamation stream. Public affairs uh, teams and their experts uh, in many agencies, uh, they tend to focus first on developing the right campaign. And this is a summary of the uh, items that we uh, thought were very important uh, as you develop your campaigns. Reinforcing the educational component is crucial making sure they're simple and fun, and they resonate with the community when you're out there talking with them. And it should be a positive message. People remember positive messages. And once people want to come back and ask more questions, and that's what we're starting to see. We had some previous campaigns, and uh, they, were, they are all very helpful. But as you see, they tended to focus on the not to do instead of what to do. And on the left is our fog uh, reduction campaign. That's oils and grease to minimize those. And on the right is a program we have, a very active in California, on no drugs down the drain. So public affairs, when they're working on this new campaign, they decided that we should package all of OCSD's messages under one umbrella. Again, keep our message simple. And we're trying to target audiences of all ages, and we're starting to have feed, getting feedback that this is very successful. And I'll show a little bit of information on our collateral materials that help with the, uh, the branding and the rollout. Our messages, again. Tell people what they should do. Be simple with the message. Be direct with the message. Our three P's, pee, poop, and toilet paper, these are the only things that should be flushed to a sanitary sewer. If you look at the history on the development of sanitary sewers, we didn't have all these other materials that people are flushing into the toilets nowadays. We were focusing on pee, poop, and toilet paper. Toilet paper. Uh, not at first, it was developed later for convenience of the, of the person. But the pee and poop were, were uh, routed to the sewers to protect public health, and we've got to get back to those issues. And we want to make sure in our campaign messages that anything we say are, is easy to remember. And as we talk to people, they can remember the three P's and they can recite them, pee, poop, and toilet paper. 
after we developed the campaign, we went through uh, several variations on logo design, and our public affairs professionals worked on this. And this was the outcome that we came up with. Now we're, we're getting the word out. We've been getting the word out. We've created a website. And we've designed flyers. We provide these flyers to our local uh, community members and to our, our satellite uh, cities and agencies to put in with their sewer bills and water bills. We developed a booth that we take out to public events. And it's been fun to participate in those. And also our giveaways that we have through our social media on our website. Some of the what I call collateral materials or giveaways. These are some of the things that we developed. Uh, we also have uh, stickers that we give people. And we're thinking about developing a very large sticker that we can put on the side of our combination sewer cleaning truck tanks and the equipment that we have out in the field and make those available to other utilities. Example of uh, an outreach event, and uh, we have a little pop-up tent and tables and, and materials, and we have all these things stored in bins where they're, they're easy to mobilize. And the feedback we get from people is they really love it. They want to come up and talk to us. They want to come up and learn more. We are uh, trademarking, or we have trademarked our logo and uh, the campaign. And we'll be working with other utilities to make this information available at no cost. And we want the whole uh, community, and now I'm, I'm pleased that we have some global partners on the phone today or on the webinar today, and think about how you can carry uh, these messages and your messages forward to minimize these products being flushed into our sewer lines that are causing all these problems. Benefits are very, very tangible. The more debris we can get out of the sewer system, we can reduce our costs, and we can improve performance in both the privately operated systems and the publicly operated systems. And this resonates in the boardroom and your city councils and town halls uh, as you talk about ways you can get your costs down if the public will cooperate with you. The next presentation is a result of the panel discussion that we had out in Palm Springs. And I do want to thank our, uh, our, our uh, friends from INDA for participating on that one, as well as uh, Bob and the representative from JWC. Steve Ogle was the representative from INDA that came out to work with us. This is the problem as we see it based on the experience we're having at OCSD. Two, uh, two major areas for confusion are you know what's flushable versus what's dispersible. Toilet paper, pee poop and toilet paper. The poop breaks down pretty easily and the toilet paper breaks down pretty easily. And, and these are examples of what are dispersible materials. Product labeling is can be very uh, confusing for the consumer uh, because of where labels are placed on the products or where they're not placed on the products or you can't read the labeling. And, and as we talk to people, we see a lot of confusion. So that is a problem, and uh, that has to be dealt with in the future. This is a little bit of history for you, and there's a lot of materials you can read. Uh, 2003, there was a, a uh, report done by Worth, and you can get a hold of this and read it. And uh, after this report was done, uh, the INDA group developed some voluntary guidelines with their European partners, IDANA. And the second edition, they made some improvements. And we like the language they have on here that the products after flushing should become unrecognizable in a reasonable amount of time. And uh, that tends to be the debate nowadays is what's a reasonable amount of time. Of course, they can't break down as fast as toilet paper. We understand that. But it's got to be much better than a piece of plastic that never breaks down, as Frank showed in his examples. In 2010, INDA asked us to help uh, some of the WEF Collection System Committee members to help with peer review. And we said we would. And uh, that process didn't start until a couple of weeks ago. So we were off to uh, not having uh, an opportunity to participate in this process. Uh, but we have in the last couple of weeks, and we have provided some comments. 
So we have started, but uh, it was real, real late in the process. Uh, Frank showed this example. When we look at packages and labeling on them, things that uh, trigger for us are things that say breaks apart after flushing. Well, uh, as you can see with the, uh, the demonstration toilets, you can flush these things and they don't break apart after flushing. Also, when people say they're safe for sewer and septic, we want to see more information. Who says they're safe and why and where's your test data? Frank showed this example. I encourage all utilities to, to use some of the simple lab equipment and do their own little stir test with using toilet paper as your baseline material and, uh, and see what you find as you stir these things. A little bit on legislation. Aubrey's going to go into this a lot more in her segment. But these are two activities that I was involved with, the one in California. Uh, very simple, but it came to a, a screeching halt as it was passing through committees in our state legislature. Uh, and then Aubrey will cover more about the activities in Maine. Frank showed this slide. Uh, market type data like this uh, really reveals uh, that there is going to be an expected growth in consumers using these products. Not all of these products will wind up uh, in a bathroom setting, but nevertheless, uh, these types of trends are concerning to us in the wastewater business. Frank talked about uh, using the SCAP form, uh, and that's a good form to use. And this is just a little bit of information, and we are filling out these forms for SCAP for our various parts of our gravity sewer system and our pressure sewer system where we're having the problems. But these are some of our findings. The, uh, the real the interesting one was we put a brand new Headworks online in our Huntington Beach plant, and we were having problems with the non-dispersible products being pumped from one of our new pumping plants over to the new Headworks, and it was clogging the bar screens and the washer compactors at the Headworks. So this is another new area where our uh, consulting engineers, who hopefully are online today, are starting to understand there's a whole other part of our sewer system that you need to understand today in designing facilities. Again, just some other examples of products that we find and we read the labels. And uh, this one uh, may have some promise. It actually started to show some dispersion after an hour. So anytime uh, manufacturers can re-engineer products and move towards more rapid dispersibility, uh, this is a good thing versus uh, something made out of plastic that won't break down. I always uh, try to encourage folks whenever I'm out speaking, no matter what the group is, again, this was prepared for a water environment group in California, how can their members help me, how can they help the industry, and it's essentially at this point in time really tracking uh, their costs that are tied to their labor, they are tracking a lot of their labor and things like this, but really telling their story and sharing this information uh, with your member association and uh, also uh, by using that SCAP form so we can start to compile a good database. And again, I wrapped up with our, uh, our message on our three P's, pee, poop, and toilet paper. Those are the only things we want flushed to a sewer. And I'm done. Thank you, Christine. Wow, very good. Well, we do have some time for questions and everything. Um, I do want to point out that um, Kristen Covey from King County actually said that they added a fourth P, which was puke. So maybe something to consider in the future, Nick. <laughs> um, so I do have some questions for you. Let's see. Patty is asking if they can have permission to use your logo. Yeah, if you will just send me an email, uh, we're, we're working this out with public affairs right now, but uh, we'll, we'll work with you on that to accomplish your goal. Great. And maybe we could put that in like a, whatever, in on the FTT side or something like that, like a response. Yeah, you can have that in with your uh, transcripts of the, today's event. We'll be sure to capture all those things and route them to public affairs. Yes, absolutely. Okay, here's a question from Jeannie. Uh, she'd like to know, have you been able to make the impact of your What to Flush campaign? Example, cost before and after the campaign? Not at this time. 
We are very interested in doing that, but it has to be on a almost like a drainage basin, like drainage basin approach. All right. Here's another question. Let's see. Okay, you mentioned that the wastewater industry had an opportunity to provide comments for uh, in this flushability, flushability guidance document. Can you elaborate on some of those comments that were provided from from our industry, um, and and what are what's your take on that? Uh, we can actually post our comments that were provided uh, and share that with uh, with the folks that are on the webinar. Uh, again, we got into the process late, and uh, we have multiple concerns, and uh, so it's better probably we can post those things and show people. Okay, um, let's see. All right, this this question is. Um, Oh, well, I'm jumping all over the place. <laughs> Sorry. All right. This 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 question is from Jeff. Um, is this information that has been collecting it and and um, Frank, feel feel free to jump in. But is the information that's being gathered is it being shared with the white manufacturers to improve their products or advertising? Yes, as much as possible. Great. Um, let's see. Here's another question from Michael. Other than the setups at events at your outreach program, are you utilizing any media means of educating the public? Yes, uh, we are using uh, local outlets for cable TV and things like that. Uh, again, we go out and we take these information to city council meetings and hand out the materials and also engage the public at the council meetings. Uh, that's two examples. We also have, uh, if you go to our website, we did a video campaign, and I believe the awards were $1,000 to each team. And uh, we had people that were creating their own videos on what, uh, what not to flush. And it was very successful. So this got our uh, local community involved in, in that manner. And that would be something good to see. And, and it's on our website, and maybe I can provide a link to WEP on how to get, get there so people can look at it. That'd be great. I, I know that um, we have a slide later that shows um, a, a great website that NACWA has been keeping up to date with links to videos and um, other, other information to share. So maybe that's somewhere we could put it as well. Terrific. Um, let's see. This is from Linda. Okay, and I think this is going back to, to Frank. This, is, this might be uh, something that you can also answer. In the deragging stud study, what was the period of time between study start and the need to derag? This is uh, Frank. Um, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you repeat it? Sure. Um, in the deragging study, what was the period of time between the, between the study start and the need to derag. Oh, uh, I, um, I mean, I, I listed the times in the slides, but um, anywhere from five minutes to to forty-five minutes. Oh, uh, and if she's making a reference to um, deragging pumps, um, you know, at, at some of our pump stations, what our experience has been every two days we've had to go out and uh, derag two or three pumps at one pump station. So the, the problem was pretty bad. I'm not sure if I answered the question. <laughs> I think you did OK. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, numerous locations. Uh, we are out there doing derags at some every other day. And then sometimes the pumps will rag up on a weekend. We'll get an emergency alarm, and uh, we'll have to go out and take care of that. Uh, so the frequencies are all site-specific, depending on the loading into each individual sewer shed. But it's way too often, as far as I'm concerned. And the trend seems to be going up right now. OK, very good. Um, let's do two more questions, and then I'll do a poll. Um, let's see. 
How about disposable toilet seat covers? Do they disperse or do they cause a problem? This is from Abraham. They disperse. Is that something you also found in your studies, uh, Frank? Uh, this is Frank. I have not tested that and, and plan to do so. Okay. Um, uh, let me do one more comment. Well, this is more of a comment. So this is, um, I see that we have a representative from INDA, David Powling on. He just announced, well, he, he's saying that INDA and Ade, Ade, Adina, I can't pronounce it. Um, Adana. Adana, um, they just announced today a code of practice for makers of non-flushable wipes to put do not flush on the package, which they say will eliminate 90% of the problem if adopted. So I, I think that's progress. Thank you, David, for sharing that information. Um, okay, let's, let's do one more question, and then I'll do a poll. So um, let's see. This is from Marcy. What are potential alternatives? What are potential alternatives to these hardy, flushable yet non-degradable wipes? Well, as we've seen, this is Nick. As we've seen in one example uh, over in Europe, one of the manufacturers based in uh, Northern Europe actually re-engineered their product uh, to gain some rapid disperse, more rapid dispersibility. And um, that's how I found out about the product. So we know manufacturers can make changes to try to achieve goals that are more uh, acceptable to the wastewater industry. And that involves just product reengineering. Pretty simple stuff. OK, great. Thank you very much. All right, guys. So. Um, uh, thank you, Nick, and Frank also for answering some questions. Before we move on to Aubrey, I'd like to do a quick poll. As you can see, I have the poll up online. The question is, how many people are participating in the webcast today at your computer? So if you could um, just start answering that, and then um, and we'll share the results. And if, if you're participating by yourself, please respond one. If you're participating in a conference room, for example, or have several people gathered around your computer, just do a quick head count. Okay, we have about 85% people have voted, so I'm going to close the poll. Um, it looks like we have, oh, can I share the results? Here. <laughs> All right, we have about 77% are single, but we do have about two to four people, 15% are two to four people at, at uh, one computer. So that's, that's pretty good. Very good. I'm glad you guys can all join us. Okay, so moving on, I'm going to now introduce our next presenter. Um, Aubrey Strauss is our next presenter. She is the 2013 Vice President for the Maine Waste. Oh, I not. Sorry. <laughs> Is, uh, for the Maine Wastewater Control Association. She also recently started her own company, Verdant Water. Based out of Maine for much of her career, Aubrey's experience includes wastewater infrastructure asset management, including CMOM and O&M planning, and stormwater management, which is both for municipal and industrial. She is a registered PE in Maine, and not only does she have a repertoire of technical knowledge and experience in the industry, but she also works on public relations and public education and outreach projects, which is probably why she was the chair of New England WEA Social Media Committee in 2012. Aubrey has a BS degree in bioresource engineering from Rutgers University, and with that, I will pass it on to Aubrey. All right. Thanks so much, Christine. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound great. 
All right, very good. Well, like Christine said, I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, specifically legislative approaches um, and whether they can help the water quality associations get where we want to be. So specifically, I'm going to start out by talking about a couple different state attempts at legislation um, where uh, those weren't successful and specifically why. We'll talk about some federal approaches and efforts that may also help us. Some ideas that uh, several different states are considering and evaluating. And then we'll just sort of review what we've learned and how the water quality associations can respond consistently uh, to some of the challenges that we're all going to be facing. So we are going to start on the West Coast. We're going to go in chronological order here. California in February 2010 was the first state in the U.S. that uh, made an effort to legislate this issue at the state level. Um, in summary, what happened or what, what this particular assembly bill included was its own definition, its own criteria for flushability, tying the behavior of a product back to, to comparing it to how toilet paper would behave. So here we're talking about the product and describing its behavior as compared to how toilet paper would react in the same condition. So in this case, it, it wrote its own definition. Um, INDA, we've talked about INDA a couple times. Um, INDA, in its own uh, correspondence with members, says that it took immediate action and wrote hundreds of emails uh, opposing, essentially, this particular, this particular bill. And specifically, what INDA was opposed to is that they felt that by proposing its own definition of flushability, tying the product to the behavior of toilet paper, that it essentially opposed the flushability assessment standards that, that Nick was talking about, the definition that it, as a, as a manufacturer's association, had taken a lot of time to come up with. So it was the, it was the fact that the two definitions opposed each other. And INDA got involved. They helped um, write some of the amendments that you can see on the screen. And they were successful in replacing that custom toilet paper based criteria with uh, the definitions in its own flushability guidelines and, and the certification process. Nevertheless, the bill was not successful for a couple reasons. Um, first of all, uh, INDA did point out or claim that the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, really already has the authority to require that any package, um, the claims on a package, be substantiated. And at the time, there was no certification for its, its process. Even if a product met the definition that was in INDA's own uh, guidelines, there was no third party uh, that was available to certify that result. And instead, what happened was INDA made a commitment to working with the state uh, in lieu of legislation, so looking for non-legislative efforts. And they made good on that promise by working with um, one of the local communities uh, in Contra Costa County. Uh, it was a, a structure called the Moraga Pump Station. And what INDA did was they got together, they had a graduate student assist them, and they took a look at the materials that were entering this station, which had a history of pump clogging. And they looked at two different types of materials. First of all, they looked at materials that were ending up uh, in the pump clogs themselves and pulling those apart, but they also looked at all the materials that were entering the station and intercepted with a screen. The pie chart you see in front of you right now is actually the materials that were on the screen, not what was in the pump clog itself. But you'll still see that there's a lot of the same products that Frank talked about and that Nick talked about. In this particular case, one that I'll point out specifically is that uh, in this in this pilot project at the Moraga Pump Station, the group found about 4% of the materials that were showing up on the screen were flushable wipes, which really should have dispersed, or in the Water Quality Association's view, should have dispersed in the collection system but didn't. I also would like to point out that uh, something that Nick mentioned to me as we were preparing for this webcast, that uh, this pump station continues to have pump clog problems. Uh, it has had spills that have resulted from pump clogs even since this pump station uh, pilot was completed. So let's jump across the country nimbly and head over to New Jersey. Again, chronologically, New Jersey was the next state that made uh, an attempt to pass some state-specific legislation uh, just a few months after California tried it in July of 2010. 
in this case, the legislation or the assembly bill language directly referenced the INDA guidance document, which is called the guidance document for assessing the flushability of non-woven consumer products. So this legislation tied the product criteria directly to INDA's own definition, its own testing methods, and its own certification process, again requiring that not only the product meet it, but also be certified by a third party for meeting that criteria. Um, in this particular case, we didn't have a success because primarily um, there hadn't been a focused or strategic effort in the state of New Jersey to get widespread support for the bill. It was more or less driven by uh, one community and didn't have the engaged leadership that we now see across the country. Um, nevertheless, we can learn a lot of lessons from this in terms of um, making sure that we do get that strategic support behind it and making sure that we have an approved methodology uh, for testing a product and then transparency in reporting how a product has been tested. Sliding up the coast just a little bit to my own state in Maine, back in January of 2011, uh, Representative Melissa Walsh Innes, who represents the town of Yarmouth, Maine, not far up the coast from Portland, um, she became interested in this issue because her own community, Yarmouth, was experiencing some chronic pump clogging issues. Um, she's very active on the, the, the types of um, products that can be managed um, as part of um, product stewardship approaches. So we presented, we as a state, Maine Waste Product Control Association worked with Representative Innes to write this legislation, and we also tied the criteria directly back to INDA's own flushability standards, saying that if it's going to be labeled as flushable uh, or safe for sewer in the state, it needs to have passed that acceptance criteria. Um, the reason that we were not successful in Maine, in addition to sort of the, the standard reasons, which we're going to get into in a little bit uh, in some more detail, we were not clear on the enforcement issue, um, and if we were to start over again, definitely we would not. We would we would need to uh, put some more thought into the enforcement issue, and we'll take a, we'll talk a bit about who that could be. But we didn't address that uh, very clearly, and as a result, Maine DEP was not able to support our, our legislation. That would have gone a long way in getting it through the uh, what's called the ENR committee, which is the Environment and Natural Resources Committee in the Maine State Legislature. So we hadn't addressed that very clearly, and also Maine DEP was concerned about uh, labeling changes that would have uh, been required. The industry also was concerned about having to change its labels and make those on a state-specific uh, basis, um, and doing so in the timeline that was proposed. So in lieu of legislation, as we mentioned, um, INDA committed to working with Maine Wastewater on this issue, and in fact the ENR uh, committee required INDA to do so, and we have to report progress back. So although the legislation itself was not successful, the ENR committee is very, very supportive of these efforts and has been really, really wonderful, I think, for, for both INDA and I, us to work with. And we're going to talk a little bit more now about what we are doing in Maine. The legislation wasn't successful, but INDA has been required to continue to work with us. Specifically, shortly after, and actually even during when the work sessions were still happening in the legislature, we started a forensics project. We'll call it a forensics project at the Portland Water District Cottage Place pump station. Um, now, why this pump station out of all the ones in Maine? We know we have a widespread issue in Maine. We've done some surveys, but we chose the Portland Water District pump station for a couple reasons. They have actually, Portland Water District, has been fighting the issue of pump clogs and wipes uh, since 2005. They were one of the first um, entities to really reach out across the country, and they met Nick back, back then already. So we've had a, a long history here of, of, uh, of, of reaching out and, and sharing our experiences. Um, the Portland Water District, Mike, I think it was uh, Mike had called in earlier or typed in a question 
asked for Nick and asked about how much education and outreach had been done. Well, in this particular case, Portland Water District did a lot of outreach. They did several media events. They did a lot of mailers. They did uh, newspaper articles. They invited several different news stations to come down into the, into the pump station. They filmed uh, one of the collection system crew actually unclogging a pump uh, right there, right in front of the video cameras and everything. Um, and despite all that, Portland Water District had to do a $4.3 million screening system of installation. It was done on an emergency design build basis in this pump station, which is a big station by, by main standards. It has a 15.2 million gallon a day maximum capacity. So we chose this because of a history there and because the Portland Water District is, is a very enthusiastic and engaged partner. So what did our forensics do? Well, our forensics was very similar to Moraga Pump Station, although we did change some of the process uh, based on some flaws we felt may have been present in the Moraga Pump Station in California. And we looked again at m materials that we intercepted. For they came in in the influent, we intercepted them on a screen. So what you're looking at in this pie chart is not actually what was in a pump clog, but what we actually pulled off a primary screen. Again, you can see that we have flushable wipes here a little bit higher than we saw in the Moraga pump station uh, incident in incidents in California. And in fact, in the different days that we looked at this pump station project and on different events, the percentage of actual flushable wipes we saw ranged from 8 to 12 percent of the material that we found. Um, that is, that, that those materials survived the journey from the flushing point to when it entered this pump station. Um, so this demonstrated to us that the flushables weren't dispersing um, as they had claimed. And it, we wanted to, after these events, after these two forensics projects were completed, we said, well, we really want to reach out and find out what is in pump clogs. So Maine Wastewater Control Association and the Portland Water District worked together to develop an SOP form where we're asking uh, utilities around the country to actually take the materials they find in their pump clogs um, after you've got that pump back online. That needs to be your priority. We know that. But after that pump is back online, tell us what you're finding. Tell us what percentage of it is paper, what percentage of it is flushable wipes, what percentage of it is baby wipes, um, and so on and so forth. It really helps us understand what is found in an actual pump clog. And I'm pleased to say that between um, Scott Furman over at Portland Water District and, and Hiram and the other folks at uh, WEF, we're getting forms in from around the country. So thank you to, very, to those of you who are sending those in to us. Continuing on, we aren't done there because now Maine Wastewater Control Association and INDA are working together on uh, a pilot education campaign. This was again required by um, the legislative ENR committee. We have agreed on a lot of pieces of this and in fact we had a great phone call with INDA just last week that we're all really enthusiastic about. Here's what we've decided we're going to be doing. We're going to be focusing this education campaign on the service area that comes into the same Portland Water District Cottage Place pump station. We know the service area very well because of Portland Water District's GIS systems and its billing records. We've decided to focus it on baby wipes specifically. I think it was uh, Frank who said that baby wipes are indestructible squares of plastic. We believe strongly that they should not be flushed ever. Two different messages are going to be sent out in this, in this pilot education campaign. The first message is an overall, which is to remind people that when you flush wipes or other things that shouldn't be flushed, you can damage the environment as well as your private plumbing, as well as equipment. The second message or the overall message in this particular campaign is going to be don't flush baby wipes. We had originally considered looking, telling, having the message be um, telling the people to look for the INDA standard do not flush logo. Well, just before we committed to that, Maine Wastewater did an inventory of the baby wipe products that were for sale just in our study area. And of the 79 unique baby products we found, only 22% of them had INDA standard do not flush logo on them. And there's a reason for that that we haven't really brought up on this phone call. And that is that not all manufacturers are members of INDA. The INDA logo really is 
um, aimed at INDA members, and it's still voluntary. So even if a company that's making these products is an INDA member, they're not required to use it. They're encouraged to, and I think, as David Powling mentioned, the code of practice they came out today goes a long way. It is a huge improvement on earlier versions of that document in strongly encouraging its members to use the Do Not Flush logo on baby wipes and saying how big it should be. And the water quality associations believe that it should also be very, very prominent. And that's an area where we're going to continue to work with INDA. Nevertheless, back to this pilot education campaign, don't flush baby wipes is going to be our message. We want our measurable goals to be two, two different things, really. We want to be able to measure a reduction in the volume of the baby wipes that are entering the pump station, um, but we also want to measure how effective the education message has been to people. Again, that wipes can cause damage to the environment, plumbing, and so on. One of the goals of our project is that we want the message to be scalable for use around the country. That's going to happen probably in a future phase um, with a, maybe a different marketing agency. But we are going to be using a third-party marketing firm to implement this. And along those lines, I'm, I'm not, I, don't have, um, I don't have any shame really in, in saying that we are looking for donations to, to help us with this pilot education campaign. So if you know, the 400 or so people on the call each want to chip in a dollar, you know, that would be great. We would appreciate it. But we are looking very forward to it, and especially now that we've honed in on the message. So that's at a state level. Very briefly, a few different federal programs and, and uh, regulations that can help us with this. First of all, to dispose of something into the sewer um, that can interfere with its operation is a violation of 40 CFR 403, which are the federal pretreatment regulations. Um, the sewer is considered part of your POTW. Um, and uh, wipes would be considered interference of it. Secondly, I mentioned earlier that the Federal Trade Commission has the authority to require truth in advertising and require that any marketing claim be substantiated. This is something that's currently, um, I think, building a little bit of steam. They have, uh, the FTC has reached out to some of our our team members and said, can you give us examples of products that have uh, what we call egregious product um, labeling? And we've done that. So if there are products that we have been testing that absolutely do not disperse and the package claims it does, or the package is used for it's like biodegradable or degradable in water, we're providing the, those, uh, those packages to the FTC. And thirdly, the third item on this slide is a federal legislation uh, that was proposed by Senator Blumenauer in Oregon um, that proposes assessing small fees on some products that can contribute to water pollution. Um, this bill is not currently active, but um, Senator Blumenauer is considering uh, re reissuing it to remove some funding that originally, or some language that included water, drinking water, and focusing it just in on the clean water product. Any of the revenues that would be collected from these fees will be dedicated to clean water SRF and similar programs that are aimed at maintaining sanitary sewer infrastructure. Back to the state efforts. Things that everybody on the call should think of. Certainly, what works in different states is not a one-size-fits-all. We have to remember that um, each of us is working in a different climate, and we have to respect the different political issues that go along with those climates. climates. But here are some things to think about. Some states are working on strengthening uniform plumbing codes or sewer use ordinances. If you're not sure what your sewer use ordinance says, it should have something in it saying that it shall be unlawful to dispose of any product that could cause damage to the drainage system or public sewer. So what we are encouraging people to do is look at that, specifically include wipes or consumer products in that definition. Um, this sewer use ordinance or plumbing code gives the municipalities the authority to issue non-compliance um, statement, non-compliance um, issues, uh, violations rather, um, in these cases. And the trouble or the challenge continues to be how to enforce it. Nevertheless, look at your sewer use ordinance 
because that's what gives you the authority. Secondly, we talked about truth in advertising. At a state level, this is typically managed by the Attorney General's office. Here in Maine, back when we wrote our legislation originally, we did approach the Attorney General's office about uh, the enforcement issue, and we did not get a lot of support. Uh, we know that we would probably have much more support with our current Attorney General. And I mentioned that the FTC also has uh, authority on this issue at a national level. Product stewardship is a program in which uh, manufacturers are held responsible for the recycling or disposal of products that they create. In California, they refer to this as extended producer responsibility. And this really can apply to a lot of different types of products. In Maine, we've used it for electronic waste or e-waste, uh, mercury switches and thermostats. A lot of states have looked at it for disposal of paint. Uh, unused paint, and some states are also looking at this for pharmaceuticals, unused or expired pharmaceuticals. Um, this is an, a very, very, very effective um, approach for helping track the uh, responsible disposal of these kinds of products. Uh, can, uh, California and Vermont and Maine are really leaders with this approach, but with the challenge with wipes is the ick factor. There's the storage and transportation and recycling of products that may be contaminated with human waste. So we're not quite sure how effective the product stewardship approach would be. We talked about assessing fees on products that are labeled as flushable. This may be incredibly effective in some states and absolutely not in others. And I can tell you as an example, here in Maine, we would not get very far with an approach that put a fee or a tax on products. Some states, including Washington, are considering banning products that are labeled as flushable. Uh, an example of a similar approach would be plastic bags, which most of you are probably aware have been banned in several different cities around the country. And last on my list are state-specific labeling. And I'm going to go into some examples of that in the next slide. Genetically modified organisms, or GMO, this is a very hot item right now. Um, Connecticut and Maine just both passed legislation that requires food that contains gen uh, GMO uh, to be labeled as such. And actually, 28 different states have proposed similar legislation. A second item where this has been successful is low phosphate detergents. At least 17 different states have implemented this um, in the last, I think, about 10 or 15 years. Um, State-specific means that the individual products have to have a specific label on them that are sold in that state. So these, what we have here, we could have the products um, have 17 different labels in those 17 different states. Third example, detergent pods. These are laundry detergent um, that comes in these cute little brightly colored packets that look sort of like candy. You can see an example of them in the bottom photo on the right hand side. And what's happening with detergent pods is that many children, hundreds of children, in fact, are being injured when they mistake these as candy. The containers they come in also sort of look like candy jars. What we've seen is the manufacturers of these detergent pods voluntarily rolling out new labeling, which again you can see in the picture on the right, and also new packaging that doesn't look like candy jars. And they've done this very, very quickly. I'd also like to point out that some of the manufacturers that make the pods are the same manufacturers that make a lot of baby wipes. So it demonstrates that when they want to, um, it can, that labeling can be turned around quickly and packaging can be changed. In Maine, we require a sign at the point of sale where these detergents are. Again, reminding parents that children can often uh, mistake these for candy and that they can harm the children, so keep them out of the reach of children. Pesticides. The picture on the right-hand side at the top shows some notices that are required at the point of sale in Maine for pesticides. The state has mandated specific language, the size of the sign, and the exact wording that needs to be on the sign. And in Maine, as I mentioned earlier, mercury-containing switches, I mean specifically uh, the, the, the legislation targeted those kids' running shoes where they light up, the heel lights up when the child runs. Several years ago, Maine required a specific label to appear on those shoes that was visible to people when they purchased it, reminding them that those shoes should not be thrown away in the landfill and should be disposed of and recycled appropriately. 
I'm going to wrap up by going through some of the concerns. When we do, uh, across the country, propose legislation, here are, the, here are the concerns that we've been hearing. First of all, from the manufacturers, we hear uh, concerns that putting a negative logo on a product, uh, what they call the prime real estate, which is the front of the package, will decrease sales. Our response to this is that currently use of a logo is voluntary. And absolutely, if there's not a mandatory need to use it, then those who choose to use it are going to be penalized. By legislating the requirement of the use of that logo on products that don't meet the criteria, it levels the playing field. Um, everyone has to put the logo on, not just some of the manufacturers. So in this sense, it, is, uh, it can benefit them. Our second response is that we don't believe that the logo needs to be um, a negative one. We think it can be very positive, for example, toilet safe, or a green message that would work with the, the manufacturer's own public relations campaigns. At the bottom of this slide, you'll see four different images. Uh, they're not the best quality image, and that's because they were just within reach of me at my desk when I was working on, when I was working on this presentation. They're from products that I had literally within my reach. Um, all of these are positive messages that are on product packaging, and we don't think this, is, this needs to be any different than that. For example, toilet safe, or sewer safe, or sewer friendly. Another concern we hear from manufacturers is that packaging is very expensive to rework and it takes time. And we fully understand that packaging can't change from, uh, from Wednesday night to Thursday morning on the product shelf. There definitely is a lead time. However, we also know that when manufacturers want to change packaging quickly, it can happen quickly. And some of the products we've been watching for years have gone through several different labeling changes all aimed at making the product be more decorative or pretty, and the Do Not Flush label uh, logo has still not been put on that. Some of the concerns we see from legislators. <clears throat> we hear that these efforts are anti-job. Our response is that we are absolutely not asking that these products not be made or used. And in fact, I would think many of the people on this call right now use these products in their own home. What we're asking for is that they're tested, labeled, and marketed accurately and consistently. Some legislators have told us that technology is the solution. We should look to pumps and screens as the answer to the, this problem. And certainly, I think our sponsors of today's call would agree to that to a certain extent. However, on our end, we also say that unplanned or emergency repairs and replacements, they, they take funding away from projects that you've committed to in your capital improvement plans. Our infrastructure maintenance is already underfunded, and in some communities, unfunded totally. And we don't feel that it's fair to put the burden on the, manuf on the municipalities uh, to fund those emergency repairs. Um, lastly, we have concerns from legislators that uh, this doesn't affect my constituency. We don't have sewers. Well, really, these products, uh, when they're mislabeled, can affect people that are on septic systems. Um, they have to pay a, a higher tank pump out cost, or they have to pay for emergency plumbing response when their internal plumbing becomes clogged. Um, small businesses, um, such as septic haulers, are impacted. When a septic hauler may be used to be able to pump out eight tanks a day and now can only pump out five tanks a day because his own truck pumps get clogged with the materials. So he's earning less income per day. And insurance companies um, are, are damaged by these products when they have to pay claims that are submitted by residents and landowners and property owners. Finally, Additional concerns from legislators. You can't change consumer behavior. Well, that's true. But we can change a portion of it if we provide clear, consistent information. When we, Maine Wastewater Control Association or NUIA, do community events and we talk to people and we show them these product packages and then show them the materials and, and, the, and the, um, the beakers where they're not breaking down, there's a lot of anger and frustration there. These are people that do read packages. They do look at the labels because they are environmentally conscious. They don't want to be flushing something they shouldn't. So there's a lot of frustration when they are told that, well, this really isn't um, a, a flushable product. Legislators say, we can't be the first ones 
we come back and say a lot of states are doing something in parallel with what we're asking you to do. And now there is a huge amount of national support and energy around this issue. So we're not the first. We have a lot of good company. Third, we can't put warning labels on everything. And that's true, except with a lot of other areas like food production, we don't allow the manufacturers or processors to write the rules. There's a federal standard and there's a mandate that the, those processors have to comply with that standard and it's enforced. Why should this be any different? In summary, there's no federal definition of flushable and there's no testing process that the water quality associations have, uh, have agreed to. There's no federal mandate to use the standard do not flush logo. It's still a voluntary logo. And again, we know there's a lot of good work going on. We're pleased that the code of practice that INDA has published this week goes a lot further than the old one, and we see that as a huge step in the right direction. State-specific legislation has failed for several different reasons, including the advocacy of the manufacturers themselves and also lack of enforcement issues. And we have not until recently had a strategic plan for how we're going to address the issue. We believe that the foundation of a successful approach to this needs to be that the water quality associations define what's flushable and define the testing process for it. Thank you very much. Back to you, Christine. Thank you, Aubrey. Wow, that's a lot of information. And um, I, I think we only have time for one question. Um, can you uh, quickly? Um, tell us what was meant in your graph that you had. Um, was the percentage data by weight or by volume? What, what exactly um, were those percentages based on? Hmm, you know what? That is a good question. I think it's by number of products, but I will I will provide clarity on that answer uh, formally when we when we close out the transcript. Okay? I will get back to that that question with that answer. Okay, sounds good. Um, well, I, I, there was a lot of other questions that came in, but um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and move on to, to Hiram and introduce him. So thank you again, Aubrey. Um, all right, so our final presenter is Hiram Tanner, Jr. Hiram serves as the manager of sewer pumping for the District of Columbia's Water and Sewer Authority, otherwise known as DC Water. He is responsible for the operation and maintenance of nine sanitary and 16 stormwater pumping stations, eight dynamic weir sites, and the 400 million gallon, million gallon per day combined sewer treatment facility for the authority. He ensures the division is in compliance with EPA regulations and the MPDS consent decree. Hiram holds a master's degree in business administration and a master's of science and engineering degree from the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton Graduate School and the College of Engineering and Applied Science. He earned his BS degree in civil engineering from Ohio Northern University and he also serves on the West Collection Systems Committee and is the chair of West House of Delegates Non-Dispersible Work Group. So um, with that, I will pass it on to Hiram. Well, thank you very much, Christine. Uh, what I'd like to do this, this uh, afternoon is talk about some of the activities we've been doing as various groups and trying to combine that and organize it into a united effort. So the WEF Collection Systems um, Committee, the Flushable Task Group, uh, started this ball rolling along with the NACWA. And we heard from Nick earlier in the day about regarding uh, his activities in California, he is also a member of NACWA and, and one of the originators of this activity. At the time of the Collection Systems Group uh, that I was first introduced to this, Rob Belay was the uh, committee chair and uh, still very active in th this uh, effort to combat the non-dispersible issue. The WEF House of Delegates decided to form a non-dispersible work group in order to take advantage of the, the fact that the House of Delegates can reach out to all the member associations and get them involved. In the, the list of WEF groups that you've seen, uh, the Collection System Committee, the House of Delegates, the Manufacturers Representative Committee are all involved in uh, putting together our first invited session on this subject in, on the at WEFTEC in Chicago, and I'll talk about that a little later. 
So some of our activities to date, uh, NACWA has been very um, instrumental in providing a website for, for our repository of data that we have. Uh, so if you have some information, you have something that you uh, think is important to this effort, you can go to NACWA's uh, flushable site and get either more information or even get permission to post information on the site. WEF is, uh, within our WEF organization, we have what we call WEFCOM, and it's been a, a very good source of communication both with, from the collection systems and the house work group. As we have heard in various uh, discussions, especially with Aubrey just now, there's been a lot of interaction with INDA, and uh, so we're not, uh, we recognize that this is a growing product area and Certainly, in our economy, needs that type of activity. We just don't need it in the toilet, <laughs> in the collection system. We have, uh, as a group, sent letters of uh, recognition to our appreciation to our senators in the state of Maine and other lo locales. We've also uh, sent a letter to Costco, thanking them for having a face-to-face -face meeting with our. A representative in, in Kirkland, Washington, uh, Bobby Wallace, who I hope is still on our call today. We continue on with the public education flyers and brochures. We we see good good advertising, good um, concepts. We send it around the um, WEFCOM and to other, and also to the NACWA site. For example, one of my favorite ones has been. Um, the use of billboards in uh, Jacksonville, Arkansas, for doing promoting the ideas very similar to what Nick has mentioned in Orange County, where they it's a it's a full approach of all different types of of issues associated with the collection system, fog uh, issues as well as the pump clog issue. We also, uh, if, for those of you familiar with the WEF operations, we have what we call WEF Max. WEF is a Max stands for WEF Member Exchange Member Association Exchange, and that, at these meetings, member association representatives from, from around the country meet to discuss issues. And this year, we were able to present the pump clog and, and non-dispersible issue to all attendees at each one of the four WEFMAX uh, association mem meetings. As a result, we got great feedback. We're able now to expand, expand the, the uh, communication outreach to more and more members, both individually as well as their associations. Early on in our activity, we, just, um, we started utilizing the concept of if somebody has a great idea, let's go ahead and adopt it. <laughs> Why reinvent the wheel? And Nuia was working with, at the time was working on a position paper on the, the non-dispersible issue and we chose to, once they finished it and endorsed it locally, we decided to endorse it as a House of Delegates and, the, and to use it and promote its use in the WEF AWWF fly-in, for those of you not familiar with that activity, it's a yearly activity where the Water Environment Association and as well as the American Water Works Association spends time with their, at, here in Washington, D.C., with their delegates and representatives as well as senators discussing issues that are pertinent to the water industry. And in this case, we asked the delegates and attendees to include um, discussing the issue of uh, non-dispersibles in wastewater. So where are we now? Um, in the Audrey, Aubrey's last slide, she discussed the, the strategic plan and that we actually have gotten a rough draft of one. Uh, and that, so those of you who are interested in participating, there's still, uh, um, there's still plenty of work to be done. <laughs> and we certainly can use you. But uh, get, given a, an idea of what's on that, being discussed on the strategic plan is that 
we have established or we want to establish overall objectives of the, of the mission of uh, improving or getting rid of the non-dispersibles in the collection systems. Um, we've shown a little bit about how we've organized the efforts of multiple groups, but that's been sort of an ad hoc. Um, we, we have a, a number of people who sort of pass information around, but we want to more formalize that effort. Uh, Aubrey talked about the legislative efforts, and that's both uh, local and national and being able to share information. Uh, key to all of this is a, a communication plan. Again, we, um, if you're inside of WEF and you're a member of the House of Delegates work group, there's a m information we can share at that level, but that does not necessarily push it out to all the various groups involved. One of the issues that we're considering doing is a, with the water environment Research Foundation is a joint project to, to sort of follow up to the 2003 non-dispersible or uh, flushable study that was done and, and this time take it further and maybe come up with some of the standards that we, we think is necessary and that we think the water industry should lead. We, we really want to come up with a, a definition of true non-dispersibility. Oh, you want me to go back? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, as Aubrey mentioned, we're working with the, the INDA, which is, a, again, we're something we're carrying, and a, po a potential for a new national survey, uh, which we'll probably uh, start taking a look at uh, this summer. By, by the way, uh, many of your uh, local um, MAs have had articles in the, in the newsletters or and or magazines, and this uh, just recently we had an article pr produced by in the web highlights discussing the issue and showing some of the problems we're having. So where are we now? Well, I think one of the very exciting things for all of us who have been working with this for the last, some of them for the last few years, but in my case, for the last year. Um, this webinar was a, was a big step forward for us. It gives us a chance to reach out to you and, and tell you exactly what's going on and how it has affected us. We certainly look forward to continuing our partnerships with the American Public Works Association and NACLA, um, and perhaps even having a more formal relationship than we currently have, but right now everything's sort of ad hoc and informal. Uh, probably most exciting to me as a, as a House of Delegate membership um, member and the work group chair is the, the WEF Tech 2013 technical session. This is what they call an invited session. Uh, it was not something planned, but they felt that, that the organizers of WEF Tech felt that it was very important uh, issue and topic and, and uh, therefore devoted a full session, session number 610, to the flushables and non-dispersible issue. Some of the presenters that you've heard today will be presenting at the WebTech and, and so many other folks who have been very actively involved in the various aspects of whether it be legislative or, or technical research will present. Uh, so you've heard from some of the people uh, most importantly, you'll hear from some of the, re the rest, including Enda, at the WEF Tech session. They have been invited. So the last slide is for more information. This is some of the people who have been very active. We had Aubrey, which you heard from. Cynthia Finley at NACWA is, is a key contact. Uh, Scott Furman at NUIA and at Portland Water District. Rob Vallea at Parsa with Plainfield Area Regional Sewer Authority in New Jersey. Christine to my left, although you can't see her. Uh, she's, <laughs> I'm here. Uh, she's here with WEF and has uh, been very active in keeping us uh, organized and focused. And then Gary Hunter and myself with the WEF HOD, or House of Delegates Non-Dispersible Work Group. Uh, with that, I'll uh, end my comments and uh, allow everyone to ask questions that you'd like and hopefully we'll have good answers <laughs> okay. for you.
All right. Well, I, I'm just looking at the interest in time, and um, I would definitely like to uh, encourage people to send in questions. Um, but I, I want to also give some time to our sponsors so they can give a, a few words. But uh, just a quick reminder, when you send in a question, please um, direct it, like say if it's for Frank, if it's for Hiram, Aubrey, or, or whoever, um, please note that in your question. We have a lot of questions to go through. I don't know if we'll get through everything, but we'll, we'll try our best. Um, but for now, I would love us to um, hear some, a few words from our sponsors. I also want to point out that um, the representatives for, for Flight Xylem and JWC are also going to be um, speaking, I believe, and participating in our technical session um, at WestTech. So, so we're very, very um, fortunate to even have them here on, on this webcast. So let me just cue this up, and Bob, I think we're, we're ready for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings all, I'm Bob Domkowski with Xylem Flight. I'm very pleased to be able to sponsor today. Um, I'm a member of the WEF Collection Systems Committee as well as the NUIA Member Association Collection Systems Committee. Okay, thank you. Next, there we go. Um, some typical products manufactured using non-woven sheet technology we find their ways today into our collection systems, and these are obviously introduced by our rate payers. Next. The reality of current wastewater pumping, though, is that there is a greater chance or, or possibility experiencing severe ragging issues uh, than there is to see large quantities of solids. The distribution curves continues to creep to the right, and especially the big concern is that these materials are great filters where grit, sand, grease, and biological matter uh, are filtered through these products and then can certainly agglomerate. Next. The original wastewater pump impeller design using a two-channel uh, two channel veins with blunt leading edges and large throughlets was first designed in 1915 by Mr. A. Ball and Wood of New Orleans and it was so-called the wood trash pump. The descendant designs today, which are basically the same designs from uh, the wood design, are what's being used in wastewater pumping and are not capable of handling today's modern trash. Next. Laboratory and field installations have shown that wastewater pump clogging is due to modern trash occurs in three basic ways. One, the impeller clogging of the leading edge or the eye of the impeller of that wood design. Number two, jamming of impeller wearing. This material is very thin, and if not protected properly, it can actually uh, travel down between the wear rings and uh, act like a clutch or a brake and really uh, cause um, higher current and more energy to be used. And finally, the full plugging of the volute, which is shown here in a vortex pump. Next. On the left is a pump covered. Uh, it's actually from Peoria, Arizona. Thank you to them. This is their cousin IT pump station. Um, the pump on the right is a flight end pump, was operating properly, but quite frequently they remove the pumps just to clean out their wet well. Next. The TV news crew visited a pump station in Thienesville, Wisconsin, uh, which is a suburb of Milwaukee, and uh, they're reporting on the pump clogging issues they're having there. And uh, while uh, in Mr. Andy LaFond, Director of Public Works, opinion, while public education is important, ultimately he believes they need to invest in improved and modern equipment to handle this material. Next. That innovation, innovative uh, product does, uh, is in existence today. It's a flight end technology where the leading edges are wiped every clean the impeller. The difference here is the impeller has horizontal leading edges rather than vertical leading edges, and they're able to be wiped clean to provide sustained high hydraulic efficiency and non-clog operation. Next. Currently, there are uh, sizes available from 4 inch through and 3 horsepower through 16 inch 500 horsepower and shortly to 20 inch and 800 horsepower pumps in the end design specifically for those master lift stations and wastewater treatment plant headworks pump stations. Next. The adaptive version of the flight end technology was selected as the 2011 Water Environment Federation Innovative Technology Award winning product. Next. 
Light is the only solids handling pump manufacturer who offers a 25% energy savings guarantee. We guarantee the end user will realize at least a 25% energy savings when changing from their existing wastewater pump to a flight submersible pump equipped with end technology. If the 25% savings is not realized, flight will pay the difference in energy charges for three years. To date, more than 400 pump stations have been successfully converted to end technology. Next. In a recent retrofit, uh, problematic solids handling pumps were removed and replaced with end pumps here in Vancouver, Washington, Anderson Pump Station. The city had spent about $8,000 removing the pumps to de them in an annual maintenance uh, costs. Since the upgrade to flight end pumps, the uh, pumps have been completely problem free and the city has actually realized an additional $3,000 in operational savings because the pumps do not partially clog and continue to operate uh, inefficiently. Next. The city of Andalusia, Alabama received a block grant to upgrade their pumps at the Riverside Wastewater Treatment Plant and their central lift station. After installing end technology, the consulting engineer recorded energy savings of 48.1% at the Riverside Treatment Plant and 56.1% at the central lift station when compared to the previous pump units. Next. And the final one to look at was Ypsilanti, uh, Michigan, YCUA upgraded four major pump stations, all of their large stations. At the Snow Road, five 12-inch 470 horsepower end pumps were installed, resulting in a savings of more than 40% in energy savings. ETE Energy has recently delivered a check to YCUA in the amount of $65,378 in support of their Snow Road pump energy savings. Next. There are more than uh, there are thousands of wastewater pumps installed in the U.S. and technology are problem-free and complete, competently handling today's modern trash. Next. Thank you very much for your time, and again, it was our pleasure to be able to support this uh, great effort by West. I'm sorry, Bob. Thank you. I, I, not I'm sorry. I'm sorry I didn't say your full name when I introduced you earlier. But yes, thank you so much for um, for for for. Um, sponsoring this webcast and also being one of our great um, volunteers on the Collection Systems Committee. Okay, uh, next we have Alec Mackey who is from JWC Environmental. Alec? Thanks so much, Christine. Um, at JWC, this is all we do. In the last 40 years, we've built 35,000 sewage grinders to solve pump ragging problems permanently for customers around the world. I'd just real quick like to go five reasons that you might want to consider a sewage grinder. Next. But first and foremost is safety. We do not want to see anyone who needs to de-rag a pump by hand. Pulling pumps raises safety issues such as confined space, raw sewage, hypodermic needles. It also leads to pump wear, pump inefficiency, and more. We hate to see workers pulling rags, and so that's why we're here to solve this problem for them. Next. The second reason is to consider grind then pump. There's two reasons. Number one, the pumps won't clog. And number two, you don't have to put a screen inside the pump station. So there's no debris to deal with, no odor, no trash pickups. Operators don't need to go down and manually rake a screen or empty a catch basin. Grind, pump, and then remove the debris at the treatment plant's headworks with the screens there. Next. Third reason, we can literally fit a sewage grinder anywhere um, inside your lift station. Challenge us. Ask your local JWC rep to take a look at a, a, your worst performing pump station. We custom build guide frames to support the grinder to fit anywhere, no matter how deep the wet well or how creep, how cramped the dry well. We can fit these grinders under a street, in the closet of a jail, on the ceiling of a hospital's basement, almost anywhere. Next. Fourth, we offer the largest size range of sewage grinders and screens available um, so we can properly size the unit for maximum efficiency. Muffin Monsters offer the highest flow rates. A channel receiving 60 million gallons per day is no problem for our largest channel monster or a small mobile home complex that's giving you trouble is no problem at just 50,000 gallons per day for our mini monster grinder. Next. And finally, after 40 years of doing this, thousands of customers, 
we continually improve our units. Once a grinder is installed, customers tell me they typically get zero pump ragging from that unit. And our research team continues to invent and improve on our units to come up with new cutting edge technologies. We're always improving the Muffin Monster and Channel Monster every year. Recently, we introduced the Baldor High Efficiency Immersible Motor, which is better for pump stations, as they rarely flood, but when they do, the grinder keeps running. Next. And of course, we have to address, if you prefer to get the screen rags out in your pump station, we can do that as well. Next. And one more, Christine. The Augur Monster vertical screen. One perfect. Attaches to the wall of a pump station right in front of the influent pipeline. It grinds screens and lifts the rags and debris to deck level where it's compacted and then drops into an auto bag bagger. This handles about 1 million gallons per day. And the next one is our bar screen monster. This unit is good for 10 to 40 million gallons per day with, uh, in pump stations with channels. Reciprocating rake screen. In this picture, you can see the screening rake descending. We offer an exclusive submersible brake motor, so our screen is much shorter than other screens, so it fits inside pump stations. We also ship this bar screen fully assembled and completely enclosed, so you just drop it in, bolt it down, and turn it on. Next. So again, for your worst performing pump station, call a local JWC rep. We have 250 sales reps across the country. A Muffin Monster or Channel Monster can solve that problem. And like many wastewater manufacturers, we encourage the industry and the wipes manufacturers to push for a recycling fee or an extended producer responsibility. Because if there, there is no infrastructure, there's no machinery without this adequate funding. And we're all connected in solving this problem together. And with that, thank you very much. Alex, thank you, thank you too. Um, uh, we did get a question. Someone wants to know how they can get a Muffin Monster t-shirt because those are awesome. That's right. Just email your local rep or the factory. We'll get it for you. Actually, I'd like to point out to those also on uh, participating in the call, um, I do believe um, JWC and um, Flight will have booths at West Tech. So, Okay, yeah, gratuitous self-promotion. I'm, I'm telling you guys to come to WebTech, but you can come to the session and you can meet the speakers as well. Okay. Um, oh, what did I do? I'm so sorry. Let's uh, get some questions. We have about 15 minutes here, and I'm going to open up all these questions to everybody else, that, um, uh, to, to even Bob and Alec, because there, there were some questions at the very beginning, and uh, anybody, feel free to jump in. Uh, here's one question from Zach. Would installing a uh, macerating chopper pump improve ragging clogging issues? <laughs> Anybody? Um, yeah, really, I think the answer, the answer is really that it's up to each utility um, if those type of, um, if that type of debris is in their collection systems, it's really their choice how they want to get it out, where they want to handle it, uh, whether it's at each lift station individually or whether it's to move it all to a, a master lift station and like. And uh, there's an array of products whether you, in fact, in New Jersey at WEF, uh, WA this year at the annual meeting, there was a workshop and it was basically called Pump It, Grind It, Screen It. And it was all those alternatives, it was a really wonderful session set up by Bob Valet. So um, I don't, I, you know, of course, I'm going to be slanted towards pumping it or using a chopper pump or an end pump. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, Alec, uh, the grindings is is on you know first off his rolling off his tongue as well. So um, it's really up to the utility. They've got to make an informed decision and what's best suited for their utility. How about um, from Frank and Nick? What what are your opinions? Actually, this is Aubrey. I'll jump in and say that I have used um, a grinder pump in some projects in the past when I was with a different firm, and they can absolutely be a very good solution. I think that you want to look at um, the head that you have coming into the specific station that you're looking at, and also look at, I think, the variability of flow that comes in, and also understand the commitment that you're making to maintain um, the, the parts of a grinder pump if you do choose to use it. Okay, here's another question. Um, I think this is more directed to uh, Frank and Nick. 
um, at the utility, do you have experience with items never making it to the uh, treatment plant um, and they're just clogging up the pipes instead? Is, is that what you're seeing? This is Frank. Um, there's, there are some points in our collection system where we see um, uh, materials piling up at maybe low points in our system. And then also, you know, wet wells, uh, we see a, quite a bit of um, these wipes and so on um, floating to the top and, and binding with grease and other floatables. So there's other ways that we have to uh, remove uh, materials uh, primarily by vectoring out uh, wet wells. So yes, we do see materials that do not uh, move on to to the treatment plant. Do you have anything to add, Nick? Nick, are you still on? Or maybe you're muted. <laughs> well, yeah, um, things, things that settle in the wet well have to be cleaned out at some point, like sands and grits, and uh, things that float like greases, uh, whether it be in a gravity pipe or in a pump station wet well or a inlet structure to a siphon, uh, you have to muck the greases out. Those, those are the most problematic things. Okay, here's a question for, for everybody on the webcast. Say that all the discussed materials do pass a screening in the pumping system. What is the impact of those materials on the various treatment systems? Are they degradable or end up undegradable solids that need to be removed with the sludge? Uh, this is Nick. At some point, uh, you know, mass isn't destroyed. It, it winds up just going somewhere else in your process. Nothing, nothing vaporizes. So most of the materials would wind up in the sludge, uh, and that's, that's what we'd see. So it add, would add to your biosolids loading at some point. And this is uh, Frank. So materials that would pass through our screenings would certainly add to uh, specifically primary uh, loadings. But um, boy, we we collect a lot of most of this stuff at our screenings, and and that goes straight to the to the landfill at a pretty good expense. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. Um, I. I guess you have an answer for that percentage question that we had earlier? I do, yes. Yeah, someone had asked about the pie charts that I had in my presentation and specifically was that percentage by weight or by count. Um, my answer was that it was by count and I want to confirm that that's true. What happened with the Portland Water District Forensics is we counted um, full products that came in. Um, the pie chart that I showed um, included 127 distinct items that were counted. We didn't look at small scraps of material, but of those 127 um, distinct products that we were able to pull off the screen, um, 14 of those were flushable quote-unquote wipes, and that's where the 11 percent came from. Okay, thank you. Um, this is, oh, here's a question from Corrine that just to clarify, when we say baby wipes, um, we're using, are we using that as a ge generic term referring to similar items such as flushable wet wipes? Very different items. When we talk about baby wipes in this presentation, we're referring to a larger wipe. It's usually a larger in terms of this, the number of square inches, and it's a thicker material. Baby wipes um, are almost never marketed as being flushable. However, the problem is that since they often contain human waste, waste material, they often get flushed anyway. So baby wipes are uh, very separate, a very separate category to the Water Quality Associations than the quote-unquote flushable wipes, which are thinner and smaller. Okay, thank you. Um, this is for Frank, Nick, or Aubrey. Um, and this is from Patrick from Boston. Have you ever come across non-woven rags in the shape of two to four inches wide by 18 to 24 inches long? And if so, would you happen to know um, who might be using such rags? That's a really neat question. No, I don't, I can't think of what that would be. 
this is Frank. I same. I haven't made that observation, and I don't know what that would be. I'm almost willing to drive to Boston to find out, though. <laughs> Do you remember in, in that main study that there was a, a photo that Rob had that it was like the hand towel, like, and it was very long, and it, 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 the hand towel just went through the, the whole system. This is um, Nick. Uh, anybody, it, this is Nick. Anybody that can get a sample like that in a Boston sample, hopefully they have another one or can get one. Uh, you know, we can work with uh, Inda regionally, and they will help us identify uh, that type of product and who may have made it if it's a non-woven. Yeah, Patrick. Seriously, if you don't mind putting it aside, <laughs> get, get in touch with me. Isn't this so gross, geeky and gross, right? But but honestly, um, when we do these forensic studies, and, and, and Inda was fantastic when they came to Portland, they brought binders and binders and binders full of reference materials. Yeah. Wow. Um, and that's exactly how we can determine what it is. I haven't seen anything that's like two to four inches by 18. It's not to say they don't. So seriously, if you're willing to put it aside or get in touch with me, um, <laughs> I'll give you my address and the Ziploc baggie. <laughs> We can have our own like uh, museum of all the stuff that we find, and here are your wipes. Um. Christina, this is Alec. That, that brings uh -huh. up a good point. Some of these unique wipes might be coming from hospitals or nursing homes. You have the power, of course, as pretreatment inspectors and publicly operated treatment works to tell your dischargers not to do that. And that's how we work with a lot of jails, putting in screening or grinding machinery to take that material out if the staff will not listen to train, training and continue to put that stuff down the drain. But watch for hospitals and nursing homes, of course, jails in your territory. And if you can pinpoint them as the problem, training, better pump, or screen or a catch basin can be the responsibility of that hospital, nursing home, or jail to put in and maintain. That takes the burden off you. Mm-hmm. That's good and to know. One other side. I'm sorry, one other sidebar is that occasionally some of the, those materials are stretchy in one or two planes, and they could just be also elongated quite a bit. That's just a thought. This brings out a good point as to why the wastewater industry is moving away from just uh, focusing on the word wipes. We're looking at all non-dispersible products. That's our real concern, and they come in many shapes and forms. Uh, speaking of all shapes and forms, uh, someone was asking, where do, what, what are tissues? Are they flushable or dispersible? Or where do they fall uh, in the mix? Facial tissues uh, are non-dispersible. Uh, non uh, they actually have a strengthening agent to give them wet strength, and uh, they're not supposed to be flushed. And if you look at some of the boxes, the Labeling uh, it can confuse consumers. Yeah. Oops. Here. <laughs> okay. That's good to know. Um, here's a question from Alvin, and this is going to be directed direct to, to you, Hiram. Um, Alvin's facility is experiencing more problems with clogs in the sewer system and actual screen binding during wet weather events. Um, are you seeing something similar at DC Water? Well, we, we haven't seen a, a, a big difference at the uh, pump station, but we have fairly large opening in our screens. At the treatment plant, they have uh, a, a micro screen level, and they are experiencing um, some problems during wet weather events. Uh, since I do not work there, I can not know how to quantify them for you, but we did have a discussion with the maintenance staff there uh, about that. Okay. Um, so there's so many questions. I don't know which is the right one to ask. Let's see. Let's see here. Um, oh, here's one for um, for you, Alec. <laughs> so this utility has recently installed a newly factory rebuilt JWC channel monster, but they're still having rag issues. So what should they look for next? And this is at an unmanned pump station. We will look at that grinder. We can change the cutters on it. We can add more teeth to it um, to cut the material smaller. Um, and then if that doesn't 
work if, if the if the grinder is overloaded or overwhelmed it it, it is it does step to a um, a screening device but we have so many configurations to try first and lots of tricks up our sleeves um, to try and solve that problem great thank you um, uh, David Powling, I'm going to give him another shout out. He has provided a link to download the edition three of the Code of Practice. So when we um, we'll we'll post that link with on the FTP site with um, any other information. So thank you, thank you, David. And also there are several people that um, shared a video that they did, like in Ontario, uh, London, the city of London, Ontario. So we'll we'll post that as well and and get back to our um, get back to NACWA and see if we could post those on the website. Um, well, I see it is almost three. We got another minute. I, uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, I'll send this all to the speakers. We'll see if we can get everything answered for you guys. And um, I just want to thank all the speakers. Thank you, Frank, Nick, Aubrey, Hiram, Alec, and Bob. Um, and, and especially Alec and Bob, thank you for letting this be for free so that we are over 400 attendees could view this at no cost. Um, I, I want to give another plug for West Tech. So you guys, please consider going where you can meet these speakers. You can uh, check out the different um, equipment and everything. So um, thank you again, everybody. And maybe we'll do another one later, OK? Take care. <laughs>